Hi guys, welcome back. Um, you'll see I'm in my withdrawal uniform again today, so you'll probably see this a few more times during these videos. Um, I wanted to hop back on because a couple people had asked a specific question about intrusive thoughts, which is a symptom that I've had, and they asked if I'd go into a little bit more detail about my experience with them, as well as um, you know, anything I've learned to cope with them. Again, I'm just going to qualify because this is another kind of potential triggering topic that even though I'm a clinician, I'm not, you know, I'm not a clinician on these videos. I'm not acting as a clinician. I'm just talking as a person going through this and what I've learned and trying to share um, my story at this point. And if it's helpful, that's wonderful. So intrusive thoughts have been probably the most disturbing symptom I've had in this. Um, they haven't, it hasn't been the most persistent. It has in the last nine months been the most persistent, but all along it hasn't been the most persistent, but certainly the most disturbing. Uh, it began back in 2016, um, my first intrusive thought, and it happened after I had my antibiotic injury, which was a real similar um, central nervous system flare-up um, or, or injury that we have in benzo withdrawal. And uh, a couple of if you listen to my story, by the day two when I was really in bad shape after the medication, um, I was walking around my house and I thought I need I'm going to go drown myself in a swimming pool. It wasn't a command to go do it; it was just kind of a, a thought that popped into my head. But with it came this incredible whoosh. It's the only word I can use to describe it, and other people use this word a lot. This whoosh of adrenaline, this whoosh of fear came over me, and immediately it sent me into a spiral. Of, of, oh my God, what was that? Oh my God, that's terrifying. Um, I'm not suicidal. I've never been suicidal. Why would I think that? You know, do I need to go to the hospital? Am I going to lose my mind? Just real, just spinning. And over the next two weeks, it morphed into, you know, anything with water from the bathtub to the shower to the sink to the toilet. It would trigger that feeling. And eventually over time it dissipated and it went away and I was like, oh, I'm kind of home free. I don't have to deal with that terrible thing again. Um, and I didn't really want to look at it. I didn't do a lot of studying about intrusive thoughts after that. In my, even in my clinical work, I just, it was so terrifying. I, I just kind of couldn't look at it. And I kind of forgot about it for myself. And it returned this past summer when I went into my kind of acute uh, crisis in my withdrawal that lasted several months it popped back up. I was having a conversation with somebody and they were talking about having gone to a psychiatric hospital and um, losing their rights for a couple of days. And all of a sudden that, you know, I had this thought of, it started with the thought of, oh my gosh, what if I lose my mind? What if I go to the hospital? What if I lose my rights? And then again, that accordant whoosh came with it. And this began the process of, 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 what I've learned has made it worse, right? So here comes this whoosh of fear and I bear down in it and I start thinking, I start trying to rationalize that's not going to happen, Jennifer. Um, you know, you're not going to lose your mind. Um, you're not going to go to the hospital. Your family knows what's going on. You have support. And I just start, you know, analyzing it and thinking about it. Oh my God, make this thought stop. I can't stand this thought. And very quickly this thought morphed away from that topic. And you will, you'll find this sometimes. Sometimes you'll have one or two core intrusive thoughts that just don't leave. And then a lot of times they'll morph into other topics. Um, and it did for me pretty quickly. And it began to start to attack me and my values and the things that I love the most in the world. And if you, you know, anyone that knows me knows I have a large family who I adore. I'm very close to. And suddenly I was um, like in a bad Again, Stephen King novel, like every, you know, The Shining and, and Salem's Lot and every horrible movie I'd ever seen, every SUV and criminal intent, all the, anything I'd ever heard or seen that was scary or sinister or sick, disturbing, um, began to pop up in my mind, you know, what if I did that? What if somebody I know did that? What if, what if, I just terrible thoughts about, you know, and, and terrible things happening to people in my life. It was just, a, it was, it was awful and it was getting worse. But what I didn't realize is that I was, I, I was kind of contributing actually to it getting worse. Okay. We don't have control over the thoughts themselves. Um, and when we're in benzo withdrawal or we're in a really heightened, anxious, sensitized state, uh, we're more prone to these types of thoughts, right? We're already, um, 
tired and fatigued and sensitized and all those things I talked about in my very first audio. Um, and so when that thought pops through our mind, instead of it just being one of 70,000 thoughts, it gets stuck. We feel that whoosh, we bear down in it and we start doing all kinds of things that actually keep it alive. Uh, these mental compulsions, we ruminate about it. Uh, for me, trying to get rid of it, suppress it. Um, my worst trait is I analyze everything. So why am I having this thought? What is this thought telling me? It must mean something. What does it say about me? What does it say about somebody else? Um, and you know, maybe you know, we also do mental compulsions like I'm just going to pray it away. Oh, I just prayed. Oh, it's still there. Why is it still there? I'm going to meditate it away. I just meditated 20 minutes. Is it still there? I'm going to distract and go do something. But again, distraction can be great, but not to try to make something go away. Because um, again, we're coming back to that checking and that ruminating and that mental compulsions, and we keep this alive. And I kept doing this. And for me, it turned into a state of being. So a lot of times with intrusive thoughts, people will say, you know, when, you know if you're cruising along and you have that thought, here's how you respond to it. Um, but for me, mine turned into like a state of being where I felt frozen to the stick. I, I lived in such a, like a mental and physical rigidity within myself, a hypervigilance of, I don't want to watch TV, a movie, music, have a phone conversation, engage the world, uh, because I was just working so hard to keep these thoughts at bay, um, that I was in such guard of myself and anything that could trip them up or make them worse or you know, re-engage them in some way. And so I remember telling people that I felt like one of those guards outside of Buckingham Palace, you know, that that kind of stand there and you, you, know, you make faces at them and you try to get them to, to, to laugh or whatever and they, you know, they don't, they don't move. And I remember, I remember being uh, in England and thinking, what are they guarding? I mean, I guess they're guarding this palace, but really, like, I'm not sure they're guarding anything. And I was like one of those guards outside of Buckingham Palace. I'm just standing still, stiff and rigid, mentally and physically, on guard, guarding what? Guarding myself from my own mind, guarding myself from my own thoughts, um, and so much energy going into trying to keep them at bay or trying to make it make them not grow and get worse that I was disengaging from all the rest of my life. I wasn't talking to people. I wasn't getting out of my house. I wasn't able to function. And all of my energy went into this, you know, again, holding them at bay. Um, and, and so when we talk about what's helpful with, with intrusive thoughts, we, we can answer that question through the back door of, you know, how do we not make them worse? We make them worse by the resistance of them. And I had to learn this because the reality is, like many of you, um, I've been a problem solver in my life. I've been a doer. Um, I've been an kind of action oriented. Let me fix the problem. Let me solve the problem. Let me analyze this issue. Let me think about what I'm thinking. Let me understand what I'm feeling. And I had to basically shift gears completely to take a stance of, you know, I have to stop being a problem solver in my life. I have to do nothing. And that to me was felt like an impossibility. It was a really, really hard thing to learn. Um, one of the things I started doing when I was again frozen and in that state was I started to reach out to people. Um, first, probably as a, as a form of reassurance, which is another mental compulsion. Tell me I'm okay. Tell me this isn't going to happen. Tell me I'm normal. Tell me I'm not going to lose my mind. But then I also just really wanted, I was trying to learn. I, I needed to understand what was happening to me. And Jennifer Lee, if you don't know who she is, she's um, somebody who's been through this. She's a psychologist. She's a benzo coach. And intrusive thoughts were one of her worst um, uh, symptoms as well. She does a lot of talking about that on her blog and she has videos and um, you can do benzo coaching with her if this is something that um, you know is plaguing you. She was useful and very helpful to me in a couple of the conversations I had where she explained you know this was again just another sensation. You know she kind of talked about it as um, you know if you ate something bad and it gave you bad gas you know um, that's your body you know, dispelling this gas. It doesn't mean anything terrible about you. Yet she would call it your stinking thinking, right? You know, um, they're your stinky farts of your brain, you know, and they don't mean anything bad about you. Just like if you eat a bunch of beans, you know, you having indigestion and gas doesn't mean anything bad about you. And so she was very normalizing and helpful. 
I also made a friend um, who, thank God, he'd been through this 10 years ago and stuck around um, to help other people going through intrusive thoughts. And I, I found him. Um, so hi, Snuff. It's not his real name, but it's my little private code name for him. But he was incredibly helpful also of being able to say, you know, Jen, these thoughts that we have of, you know, what if I hurt my child? What if I hurt my parent? What if I did this terrible thing? What if this terrible thing was done to me? What if I, you know, he was really helpful in kind of normalizing, you know, you've got a limbic system on fire here. And one day when I called him and I said, Snuff, like, I, you know, I have a rational, wise mind. Why can I not um, figure this out? Why can't I stop these things from happening? And he it was a great description. And he said, you know, it's like taking a big fat elephant and trying to shove it into like a size two petite pink dress, you know, like it's not going to work. The elephant being our, you know, heightened senses, sensitized nervous system, you know, the, the, this, this, you know, highly active, wildly uh, misfiring limbic system that we have. Um, and trying to shove it, you know, into this pink petite size two dress, which is basically our wise rational mind, it's not going to work. And that fight, that resistance kind of keeps it alive and it keeps us stuck. And so that was really incredibly helpful to me. And DARE, I mentioned DARE in another video, is another resource I think could be really helpful to people. Again, they don't specialize in benzo withdrawal, but they do with anxiety and they talk a lot about intrusive thoughts. And they talk about giving kind of your anxiety or your symptom a cartoon character to kind of um, you know get a little playful with it, add some levity to it, make it not so serious and scary. And I would think about this big, you know, when my thoughts would come, I would think about this big fat elephant, you know, and me trying to like, you know, push it away, shove it away, analyze it, make sense of it, intellectualize it, you know, ruminate about it. all these things. I was shoving it into that pink dress and it wasn't working and it was making me frustrated and it was making my mind worse and the thoughts more stuck. Um, so those are, you know, in terms of what was useful for me, it was two things. It was, first of all, realizing I, I didn't have control over the thought but I did have control over recognizing that I, I could potentially be making it worse by all of these mental compulsions and getting frozen to the stick thinking about it and trying to keep it at bay. Um, the second thing for me was also realizing it was just my thing. Uh, it was just my symptom, right? And so um, it wasn't, it wasn't going to necessarily go away. And as long as my system was sensitized, it was going to be there, um, just like somebody's palpating heart. You know, they go get it checked out by the cardiologist. Your heart's fine. It's just withdrawal. When their heart palpates, they don't have to go to the ER. They don't have to call the cardiologist. Same thing for me. When the thoughts come, yep, there they are. That's my thing. That's my symptom. That's the way my withdrawal manifests, one of the ways it manifests. And I just have to know that and not be surprised by it over and over again. And then I can kind of just work to not solve the problem. And it is hard to not be a problem solver in this, right? Because it's intuitive to try to stop things, to try to figure it out, to push away when we feel bad. So um, I'm gonna, you know, put some of these resources down at the bottom uh, um, of, of, of this, if, if it's helpful to kind of think about it. I'm trying to think if I've left anything out that I really wanted to make sure that, um, that I covered. Um, you know, certainly if you're going through this, I sympathize and empathize with you deeply because it's, um, it's a it's a it's a tough situation and and like I said it's intuitive for us to bear down and lean in and fight and try to push these things away uh, and the more we do that the more we actually um, you know cause problems so so a couple of other resources that um, were helpful to me uh, I just want to make sure I get to them I mentioned Dare again Claire Weeks who I always mention. Um, Again, she's deceased, but her writings and stuff are useful. Again, not for benzo withdrawal specifically, but all of these things help us in terms of understanding our symptoms and maybe learning some new skills. Um, she was the first person that I heard talk about kind of obsession, sticky mind, stuck thoughts as being strange thoughts in a tired mind. And I would say that to myself all the time. So these are just strange thoughts in a tired mind. The other thing I did was I um, created a band on my arm and I wrote on the band WWWMS, What Would Wise Mind Say? There's a book called Overcoming Intrusive Thoughts where Martin um, Seif 
and Sally Winston, I believe they're authors, I'll put it down below, um, but they talk about um, uh, uh, wise mind. And we do have a wise mind in this, even if it doesn't always feel like we have access to it. And so what, when I would look at my band and say, what would wise mind say? I would think my wise mind would say, you're in a neurochemical shitstorm, Jen. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. And that's really the key to all of this is not to fight it, not to try to analyze it, understand it, and push it away or break it down or pray it away or whatever. It's to just recognize it's actually irrelevant. Okay, using Jennifer Lee's thing, it's indigestion. It's it's just a function. You know, it's our brain doing its thing, and it's really irrelevant. The content of the thought is not there. Uh, is is not relevant. Think about you know again when we're not in a sensitized state, we would have these kind of normal thoughts as part of our seventy, eighty thousand thoughts that come through per day, but we're not getting stuck in them. We're not fearing our state. And then creating, you know, a situation where um, we become overwhelmed by this. Um, Nathan Peterson is another person that I spoke to in this. Paige Pradko. These are just different people that I found that are not benzo specialists, but they're anxiety specialists. Um, Michael Greenberg is another one. Uh, again, I'll put their names below. Uh, but they all. What was cool about it was that as I began to kind of do my research and say, okay, I really want to understand intrusive thoughts. I this is you know this is the most insane thing I've ever been through in my life. It's terrifying. Um, as I pulled from you know these six, seven, eight different resources, and I realized everybody's saying kind of the same thing. That feels like when you stumble upon truth for me, like when you've got you know eight or ten different people that have no connection to each other and have different trainings. You know they're come from different backgrounds, but they all kind of land at the same conclusion, um, then you kind of hit, you know, pay dirt in terms of, you know, moving towards maybe some sort of solution and some sort of relief. Uh, again, I'll list them below. Um, and I'm sure I've, you know, kept, have not hit everything that I've wanted to hit in this talk. I may have to circle back. And if you have any questions or thoughts, you know, feel free to put them in the comments or you can reach out to me on Instagram by the same name. I think there's a way to message me on Instagram privately and um, take good care.